Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Good. I hope you've all had time to stretch your legs and get a little bit of coffee or water and get ready for this final panel. Um, I'd like to thank the National Building Museum and the NAOP for um, putting on this terrific conference and for inviting mm -hmm. me to participate. Um, as the uh, final panel of the day, we have a somewhat different mandate from what's come before, and I think it's a two-part mandate, both first to reflect on the conversation that, um, that has happened throughout the day that you've heard thus far, uh, and second, we hope to point the conversation forward to discuss what the Olmsted legacy uh, means in an age of climate change and technological change and demographic change. Um, and to do that, we have a terrific uh, group of panelists, um, uh, Carolyn Finney, Will Rogers, Mary Schoonover, who will essentially introduce themselves. I'm going to ask them to come up and talk about their work um, after I make a few brief opening remarks. Um, and how it relates to that Olmsted legacy. And then we will gather uh, and hope to have a little bit more time for conversation among the panelists than has been true um, earlier in the day. And the presentations that you'll hear, I think, will be a bit shorter um, than some of those previous panels. So there, um, I think, in terms of my introductory remarks, there are a couple of threads that I see running through all the conversations that I want to talk about, and then maybe a couple of themes that haven't been mentioned or haven't been talked about uh, too much. Um, in terms of those threads, I think the first one is technology. John Christensen uh, talked about the potential of bringing smartphones into the landscape and people tweeting and promoting park spaces from uh, inside those parks. I think it's also worth mentioning and thinking about the opposite trajectory um, and what happens when we actually bring the landscapes to our desktops or to our own iPads. Some of you may have read in the news in the last couple of weeks that Google Street View uh, is now actually offering a tour of the Colorado River as it goes through the Grand Canyon, a collaboration uh, between Google Street View's team and American Rivers, uh, which is a first attempt to kind of chart the, the natural landscape in the same way that the built environment of the, uh, of the cities of the world have been now brought um, to our screens by Google. Um, and technology is also connected to some questions, I think some important questions of access. That's a theme that we've talked about a lot and we'll talk a bit more about uh, with this group. Um, there's now an app on that you can get on your phone call, called Our Malibu Beaches, um, which was developed by Jenny Price and others to help um, uh, residents of Southern California get access to the public beaches of Malibu, which are very cleverly um, blocked off by homeowners. Um, along that stretch of coastline, and that, that app, I think, is typical of ways that technology may begin to help us navigate and get access to parts of the natural landscape in ways that I think are connected directly to a lot of what we've talked about. Um, also, given that we're here in Silicon Valley, given that I've just mentioned Google Street View, I think it's also important to talk a little bit um, about the attitude of companies like Google, um, figures like Elon Musk, uh, to the idea of collective public space and the extent to which their visions, which are largely libertarian, often, uh, often dedicated to ideals of private development and very suspicious of public development and public initiative, um, to what extent those visions are a challenge to the Olmstedian vision, which is so much about um, a collective idea of public space. Um, and I mentioned uh, as two examples of that, the driverless car that Google is working on, and also the Hyperloop train that Elon Musk has talked about as a replacement for the high-speed rail project, uh, really an attempt to kill the high-speed rail project uh, with a high-speed train of his own, um, uh, of his own um, invention. Uh, that is in, as he would admit, the very early stages. But I think given that attitude and what it means for public space, that's a theme that we ought to be thinking about. The second thread that I want to mention is the political one. Uh, we began hearing from Bill Deverell this morning about the hard, what he called the hard-headed political acumen um, of, the, of the Olmsted uh, Brothers Bartholomew plan, uh, the Parks playground and, uh, Playgrounds and Beaches plan. Um, and the, that document, uh, for those of you who haven't read uh, Bill and Greg's terrific book, 
even by design, what's astonishing is not only the forward-looking um, uh, design of that proposal, but also the detailed in the appendix. If you look at the incredible detail, incredibly detailed proposals for paying for implementing that plan. Um, and then we heard from Lucas St. Clair about uh, thinking about his campaign uh, for a national park as a kind of senatorial campaign and picking up um, um, that idea of political acumen. And then from General Jackson, we heard about his relationship with Governor Brown um, and about the political campaign that was necessary in places like Buffalo to um, get this Olmstead vision um, implemented. And I think that's something that's really connected for those of you who are educators to how we teach architecture, how we teach landscape architecture in this country. Um, I've been teaching some architecture students recently and I am astonished both with that group and, and, and more broadly when I go to reviews around the country, I'm astonished at how little uh, students are asked in architecture schools and in landscape architecture departments to think about these political questions, to think about what it means to get these plans and their designs implemented and what it means to navigate the incredible political complexity um, and overlapping jurisdictions as we've heard of a city or region like Los Angeles. Uh, and so in terms of how we think about these landscapes and how we create them, how we carve out space for them, I think those are important um, issues to think about. I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned today uh, is suburbanization and what happened in this country in the middle decades of the 20th century. Um, both Sam Hodder and, and Milton Chen talked um, about the pursuit of happiness and, and talked about um, the pursuit of happiness in the Olmsted vision as being very much a collective one, a collective idea, a mechanism, as Milton put it, for uh, civic participation. And I think what shifted uh, as this country suburbanized and as countries, uh, as cities like Los Angeles developed along a suburban model in the middle decades of the 20th century is that idea, the pursuit of happiness, became, of course, very much connected to individual ideas. Um, and so instead of building uh, one single central park in a city like Los Angeles, we began to think that everyone could have access to a little miniature central park in their backyards. Uh, and that went hand in hand with a, a really uh, dramatic, even radical privatization of the metropolitan landscape in Los Angeles and many uh, cities uh, like it. Um, and I think what, what I find myself writing about as an architecture critic who looks at LA as his principal subject is that the city, the region is now in the process of trying to retrofit essentially that suburban landscape uh, to move into what's been called a post-suburban um, uh, era uh, or a more public and more urban era where we are moving away from the suburban car-centric privatized landscape and maybe in halting ways uh, toward a less car-dependent uh, denser, uh, more public in some ways, not incidentally less Anglo uh, future. Um, and I think that, that shift, that kind of retrofitting of the suburban landscape means, in terms of the themes that we've talked about today, really needing to carve out new space uh, and new ways of thinking about park space. So in a city like Los Angeles, this means, uh, in terms of my work, primarily thinking about the streets themselves as public space, as potential landscape, not just in terms of how parkways and greenways were designed in the Olmsted uh, designs that we've seen earlier, but how we can think of the streets themselves as the major reservoir of open and public space um, in a city, a region like Los Angeles, particularly when we can begin to design them following a complete streets model in ways that uh, open up more space for pedestrians, people on bicycles, and not just thinking about those corridors as ways to move cars as efficiently as possible. So that's a great reservoir of potential landscaped uh, space, civic space, public space. Um, and also in Los Angeles, we're in the midst of a real expansion of our, uh, uh, of our transit network. Because we're a park poor city, as we've heard, uh, because we're a built out city, uh, one of the greatest potential places for thinking about new open space, new green space, is greenways that go alongside these new transit networks. And I think the great bureaucracies like the MTA in LA and other cities around, uh, other cities around the country need to be thinking more creatively about, as we extend light rail, say, the, the potential for creating greenways along those spaces for cyclists, for pedestrians, and just for uh, park space. 
Um, and finally, in terms of what we haven't talked about, since I'm an architecture critic and I write a lot about um, not just new buildings, but new landscapes around um, Los Angeles, uh, we haven't talked a lot about design and what role design plays in uh, bringing people to spaces. I think this is particularly true for the millennial generation, which sees the world through their iPhones and has been trained to think about the power of design um, by the success of a company like Apple. Um, but also to begin to think as we uh, point this um, idea of the Olmsted vision forward, um, if we want to hold fast to certain key Olmstedian ideals, let's say the humanism, the democratic impulse that was very much at the heart, as we've heard today, of their work, um, does that also mean holding fast to a certain idea of what kind of design they were producing? It's my feeling that we can break those two things apart, that we can hold fast to the ideas of humanism without thinking that every park has to look picturesque in the same way um, that sometimes we think of an Olmsted park looking, uh, and that we have to think of those as two, um, two different categories um, uh, of legacy, two different ways of thinking about what the Olmsteads uh, were interested in. Um, and it's my feeling that the, the really crucial ideals are, are, are the ones that are more political, more civic about humanism and, and, and democracy, as we've heard from so many uh, of the speakers. So those are some of the issues that um, I hope we'll be able to talk about once we reconvene. Um, particularly, I think the, the role of technology and how these panelists think about um, technology and access uh, and how they're connected or not connected and then, and then these political questions about how we implement um, these plans and, 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 uh, and what, what kinds of case studies we can look at around the country of um, either a, a successful park space that has been expanded or preserved or cautionary tales um, from cities that have tried and failed. Uh, to carve out new, new, uh, new park space. Um, so that's uh, that's my overview. I, know I want to invite Carolyn Finney to come up uh, uh, first and make some remarks. So we'll hear from our three panelists, and then we'll we'll convene up here for conversation. Thank you. Hi, everybody. There's a lot of people here I haven't met. So I was told. First of all, I want to thank the people who invited me here today, the National Building Museum and the National Association for Olmsted Parks. Um, I have to be really honest. <laughs> I also didn't know that there was a difference between Frederick Olmsted Sr. and Frederick Olmsted Jr. Uh, I have been seriously schooled in Frederick Olmsted today, which has been kind of interesting for me. Um, so it was important for me to be honest about that because that actually informed the perspective and the way that I listen to everybody today and what I've come in to say. I have, I'm only gonna take about 10 minutes. Uh, I wanna jump around a little bit because I'm supposed to introduce to you why I'm here and who I am and also a little bit about what I'm thinking about what I heard. So I'm gonna kinda move those back and forth and hope they make sense and I'll explain that picture shortly. Oh yeah, what should I do? Oh, you're just so kind. Don't look too closely. Okay, <laughs> um, so I was reading some stuff about Frederick Olmsted Sr. before I came here today, and one of the things that I was trying to find how I connected with him personally. You know, often I find as somebody, I'm a professor at UC Berkeley, uh, we can, that's another conversation, but there's a way with them, we often come to a topic from the top down, and I'm really interested in coming at it from the bottom up. What's real for me personally before I think about the larger ideas and how we do things. And one of the things that really attracted to me, attracted me to his story, was the idea that both him, as well as Frederick Olmsted Jr., did a lot of things in the world and brought that experience, their travel, who they were, how they worked, how they showed up day to day to their ideas and their vision. And so I'm thinking about when I introduce myself, I, I wanna say to you that for many years, I spent a lot of years in the arts. Uh, then I spent about five years backpacking in different parts of the world. I would do it for six months on my own, I'd come back, I'd save some money, I'd go back and do it again. Near the end of that period, I spent about a year and a half living in Nepal in a village, and it was at this point, I had never finished my undergraduate degree, and I decided I'm gonna go back to school. So I went back to school in my later years, uh, finished my undergraduate, then did a master's, then found myself doing a PhD, which I finished about eight years ago. Uh, and I'm a geographer, and I like to say I'm a cultural geographer in particular. Um, I wanna say it that way because actually, 
at the core of what I do, I'm really interested in people and their relationship to place, you know, and their visions, their sense of identity, and how they express those relationships over time. And so when I think about things like parks, uh, I think that's really important when we talk about connecting people to parks and what that means, and when we use words like diversity, what that means, and when we use words like relevancy, what that actually means. Our first two speakers today sort of were part of the, the cadre of people today who've introduced me to Frederick Olmsted, so this is me jumping around. So I just want to read a little bit of what I heard, how I interpreted what I heard. And I also don't mean any disrespect, but I called this Flojo. In the shadow you can see critical cities, integrated, meaningful, better, dominant. He was the first to stick to it. He was the first to find the next job, unparalleled, focused on conservation, planning, people, and parks, remarkable, daring, meticulous, interconnected, and green, visionary and straightforward, necessary for many, necessary for happiness, necessary. Flojo, with uncanny accuracy, he got all that was right, mixing and revising, bringing his visions to fruition, taking time, taking root, taking a good thing with canny, uncanny accuracy, in plans realized and plans shelved. There is much more to learn. There is much more to carry forward. A metaphorical thread with, with nature at its heart, defining the realities and delicate ecosystems of pasts and present. Who's going to make it work now? So this is how I came to this in terms of what work needs to be done now. So this is what I was hearing this morning when people were introducing him, to kind of interpret it for myself. Then I was also thinking about before I came here, so how, somebody asked me about a week or two ago in an email, how, how did Frederick Olmsted influence your life? Now remember what I said, which was, I actually didn't really know much, so I had to do a little homework. I'm originally from New York. Uh, in my 20s, I actually lived on Ocean Parkway right at the top, 31, where's my Brooklyn person? 31 Ocean Parkway, Prospect, at, hello, hello neighbor, for 11 years, right? With Prospect Park right outside my window. I had no idea up until about yesterday, <laughs> actually, that park was built by one of the Olmsteads. So I realized indirectly that, that his vision somehow influenced the way I navigated and negotiated space in that place. The reason I have this up here is for the, uh, the other reason that I bring myself to how I more generally think about landscape uh, and how I relate to it. So I know you're from New York. Um, I'm originally from New York. I was born in New York City. This picture is a picture of the Tishman Estate. The Tishman Estate is about 30 minutes outside New York City. City. The Tishmans own a lot of real estate. My parents were the caretakers for this uh, land for 50 years. So my parents, there in the corner, in the earlier days, they're still with us, but they, they look a little older these days. Uh, after my dad came back from the Korean War, um, they have a high school education. They're originally from the South, and like a lot of black folks at that time in the 50s, couldn't find a job in the South, so decided to come north to New York. He had a choice of being a janitor in Syracuse, New York, or he could be the caretaker for this estate. So he became the caretaker, the gardener, the chauffeur. My mom was the housekeeper for a lot of years on this estate. Um, that's a longer story. The, the reason I put it up there, and I wonder actually, I don't know the history of how this estate got designed. It's a 12 acre estate, there's a lake, there's a swimming pool, there's multiple gardens. It's a really stunning. That house that you see there is actually that gardener's cottage. That's where we lived. What I'm not showing you there is the big house that the Tishmans came to on weekends and holidays. Um, we were the only black family in that neighborhood. There's, there is no, we were the only family of color in that neighborhood for years. Schaefer of Schaefer Beer lived next door. Harry Winston's got property down the street. The wealth in that neighborhood is astounding. This was the late 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, one of the things I think about is that my parents thought they couldn't have kids. They adopted me, then they relaxed, then they had two boys. So there was me and my brothers. And we had run of this place like it was our own park. So I really grew up outside in a kind of manicured and constructed landscape that was quite stunning. Um, and I feel quite privileged to have had that experience. But I also remember getting stopped by the cops when I was nine years old walking home because they didn't know there was a black family wanting to know where I was going. I would explain it to them and he'd say, oh, so do you work there? And I'm thinking I'm nine, right? <laughs> uh, 
these stories of, um, because we lived up on the hill where all the nice houses and beautiful open spaces were, I went to a public elementary school and I used to get, from fourth grade to sixth grade, I got beat up regularly by um, some of the black girls who lived in the poorer section of town because I thought I was better because I lived up on the hill. And what did it mean that I got to live up on the hill with all the nice trees and the fresh air and the woods and I was able to play outside and I had no way of articulating that when I was young. I have a lot of more stories I could talk about that, but I don't want to take up your time with that. But for me, this is where the issue of difference comes into play. And I am thinking about difference all the time. What does it really mean in terms of how do I, as an individual, bring that to how I think about parks and landscape and access and relevancy and what stories are told and who do I see? I paid attention to every single image everybody put up here today. You know, part of it is because I can't help myself. Uh, and part of it because images are really powerful and some of you did talk about that, the importance of if we're looking to engage different kinds of people, who are we, who's actually out there willing to welcome those kinds of people? Um, difference, difference, I wanna make sure. I was thinking about when I was reading about uh, Olmsted Sr. and then hearing about Olmsted Jr. that during the time that Olmsted Sr. was doing his work, what else was going on at the same time? Slavery was going on. Native people were removed from a lot of the lands that we are talking about today, and many of them are still fighting over those lands that we are sitting here talking about today. Um, I was thinking about Olmsted Jr. and while he was planning his wonderful spaces, and I am not diminishing anything that they're doing, but for me there's multiple realities that go on, right? That was during the time of segregation, so my family couldn't go to a lot of those spaces or feel comfortable going to a lot of those spaces. And there's a legacy of that today. So for me this is about a moment of convergence, right, of really understanding. I know a lot of people come to me, and I had the privilege of being on the National Parks Advisory Board, the California Parks Forward Commission, work with a variety of uh, environmental groups that are honestly and earnestly trying to engage diverse people and what that actually means. And the first thing that I always say is, so what, are, what is your capacity to actually do that work? You know, people talk about changing demographics, and actually I've been talking about changing dem demographics. That's a bunch of numbers. Do you know what those numbers are? Those numbers are actually people. Those people are actually stories. Do you actually know what those stories are? Because they bring those with them when they sort of engage these spaces and engage in these conversations. I was just telling uh, someone just a moment ago that I actually don't like to use the word outreach anymore, because outreach actually, for me, means that it, there's a one-directional relationship. I have something to give to you. I assume you have nothing to give to me. I'm interested in relationships of reciprocity. So those of us who are looking at diverse communities and supporting the designs that you're doing, um, moving the Olmsted legacy forward and how that looks different, how do we do that in terms of building relationships of reciprocity? Uh, we have a moment here, a moment here that's about the past and the present as well as the future. I don't think we want to take a, just a big you know, paintbrush and brush stroke over it. I think we want it to be deep. If I learned anything today about what you all have told me about Olmsted is sort of the deep thought, the deep vision. I think one of my favorite um, things that I've heard and that I read about him is the idea, the restorative powers of the landscape. The, the restorative powers of the landscape. I think about myself, even in the moments of microaggression and feeling like my, my family and I didn't belong there but at the same time, I felt restored. I had my moments on that landscape. And so when we talk about this idea of restorative landscape, um, for all of the public, the public is diverse. That's gonna take work, that takes deep work. We have to look in the mirror at our own biases, what we don't know. We have to be willing to lean into that, to be in true relationship that's deep, so that when we talk about stewardship of these lands and these landscapes, that it becomes something real over time, not something that's just something we feel like we have to do. I think it should be something that we want to do because I think it matters for all of us. Thank you. Thanks for those of you who are still here. I don't have any pictures. Just think about all the great images you've seen all day and, uh, and that will suffice. Um, thanks to the Association, the National Association of Olmstead Parks. This has, been, this has been a really fascinating day. Um, I thought I knew a fair amount of, about Olmstead coming into this. Um, uh, I know a lot more now, and I think I have a whole lot more to be thankful for. Um, I don't know where Bob Doyle is, but I have a special thanks to Bob. Uh, Tilden Park is our neighborhood park, and so that's the place where I've gone for so many years to make that connection with nature with my family. Um, and so to Bob and his team at the East Bay Regional Parks District and the Olmsteads 
thanks for Tilden. Um, we, got a, we have a real challenge on this panel late in the day to try to pull together uh, so many well-articulated thoughts by such a great group of speakers and then somehow turn those, pivot to the future and, and, and look at what we can pull out of this. And I, I'm, I'm certainly not up to that challenge. Um, but I will, I will offer some observations on, on three, three topics briefly. Uh, principles, challenges, and a, a few causes that I see for hope uh, in how we can make some real progress. Excuse me while I read my notes here because um, I've been taking them all day. Um, our speakers have reminded us of the principles that Olmsted and the Olmsted family has left us uh, with regard to his work and, and the, an interesting question is how we take those principles and apply them here in the 21st century. Uh, and a few of them, to put them quite briefly, nature matters, people matter, parks matter because people need a place to connect with nature, uh, which is why close to home parks are so critical. Wild places matter, and Olmsted championed the protection of the remote places of inspiration, home to other species, but also to the natural resources that we need to steward into future generation. And that sense of importance and that principle of stewardship is, I would argue, absolutely critical, particularly today. Democracy matters, and, and the Olmsted saw parks as the great democratizers. Planning matters, and particularly planning that starts with place with what the land tells us about the ecological and aesthetic and other features that are worth preserving through the planning process. Uh, profoundly important, I would say, uh, today. And also I'll add, having listened to John Christensen, that contingency matters. I hadn't heard that word used in that point, in that way before, but the idea that, that what happens locally and what happens in a neighborhood can really make the difference between what happens uh, citywide with respect to parks and open space. So these uh, principles resonate in particular for the organization that I work for, the Trust for Public Land. Uh, we've been around for about 40 years. Um, our focus is on land for people um, from Main Street to Mountaintop. And whether we're talking about the creation of the Santa Fe Rail Yard Park or the protection of Katahdin Lake uh, in Maine's North Woods, um, that, that focus uh, on cities uh, is particularly important because if we don't get people connected with nature close to home, what hope have we to get them connected with the wild places of inspiration that are so important to all of us? So in cities, we've worked to build parks and trails and playgrounds, uh, greenways, uh, to create what we call healthy human habitat. And one measure of that for us is that we don't think anyone should be more than a 10-minute walk or a half mile from a park. Uh, and and in many, many of our cities, more than half of our children are growing up without that close to home access. And we think of them as an endangered species. And we've done the studies, our park score tool, an online tool has looked at the 50 largest cities. We've looked at park access, we've looked at park spending, we've looked at amenities and parks, we've looked at park area uh, and rank cities. Um, and, uh, and the lack of access is absolutely um, extraordinary. Um, and it's, it, it can't always be correlated, as John said earlier, to, to wealth, but I can say the quality of parks and the ways in which they're maintained, are, there often is a correlation um, to socioeconomic um, status. Outside cities, we've done over 5,000 land protection projects, 3 million acres, give or take, who's counting. The important thing is actually the quality of the place and our connection with those places working with our partners, federal, state, and local, to bring private lands that people truly care about into public ownership. Uh, and we've often raised the, the public money to do that in, in coordination with our 501c4, the conservation campaign. Uh, and we've helped with voter-approved voter initiatives to raise about $35 billion over the last 15 years. So with the work that we do, um, from Main Street to Mountaintop, it's no wonder that the principles of, of Olmsted absolutely resonate with us and are highly relevant to park creators and to conservationists across the country. So let me talk a bit about challenges, old and new. Uh, and, and some of the challenges that Olmsted and his peers faced are absolutely still there today. 
uh, politics and money, for example. And then uh, creating livable cities, protecting exurban landscapes from urban sprawl, resource extraction. But there's some new ones that they didn't face that we face now, and we heard about them earlier. Disconnection from the outdoors, nature deficit disorder, impact of technology, the negative impacts of social, tech, social media and technology on uh, people's connection and willingness to get outdoors. Milton Chen shared ideas and models for connection and education. We heard about birdathons and all manner of connection opportunities at Jack London State Park. And engagement in listening to park users through social media and why in their own diverse and tweeted words, they care about parks and nature. Also, the world is a lot smaller since Olmsted's time. We're all breathing the same air and sharing the same global impact of our species on climate. Climate mitigation and adaptation demand additional functional requirements of parks, greenways, trails, and playgrounds, asking them all to, also to act as sponges for stormwater runoff or shoreline buffers for storm surge, or connectors to provide alternatives to cars or coolers to mitigate the impacts of heat islands. Then there's the public health impact, and we heard also about lifestyle choices uh, and, and their impact on public health, and the fact that the only way to really address obesity and the related epidemics of diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, is through diet and exercise. And so many people don't have access to health clubs, can't afford them. The outdoors and our park systems are the place where that exercise so often takes place. Now, plenty of the Olmsted firm's work was in greenfield development and thoughtful planning of new communities. But today, as we repattern our cities to make them healthy, more livable, and denser, recycling underused and contaminated land is increasingly a major strategy. And then there's stewardship, and we heard plenty about stewardship from people who should know, like Elizabeth. This has always been a challenging issue, certainly was challenging in the days of Olmsted. It's perhaps even more challenging right at the moment for us. Uh, and the opportunity for stewards to come together and begin to blur the lines between city and country, uh, a collaboration in Sam Hodder's words between federal, state, and local that give us the opportunity to create a connected web of parks and green space, because frankly, to parks users, they don't really care that much about the steward. What they care about is the experience that they're having. So that's another opportunity as well. The other key stewardship need is effective public and private partnerships. And we certainly heard from General Jackson uh, that we need more public and private funding. And we certainly don't want to put ourselves in the position where we're allowing uh, government off the hook and relying overly much on private funds. So both are absolutely critical. And that fund funding shortage is related to the age-old challenge of money and politics. Not enough money to create or maintain parks and protected lands, like getting water from rocks, thanks to Bob Doyle for that Mott quote, it's a great one. And politics certainly plays a role in, ten in our tendency, not ours, but many's tendency, to treat land and nature as commodities and, in, and putting resource extraction, turning a profit, great, great letter from, uh, from Olmsted, ahead of the values and benefits that Olmsted stood for. And then there are also the politics of local culture and land use, whether it's hunting or snowmobiling, and the kinds of things that Lucas and his family are dealing with as he and many others work on a vision for a 21st century national park in the Maine North Woods. So great principles, significant challenges. I'll leave you with a couple of thoughts that we see as we work as implementers across the country that give us hope for pushing ahead in spite of the challenges. First of all, Dr. John Crompton at Texas A&M um, is very fond of saying that parks are never at the top of, an, of a city's investment list. But as soon as parks, be, be, they're viewed as an amenity and an important amenity. But as soon as they begin to solve critical social problems, they move up on the list of investments and take on more priority. And there are three things that parks are doing right now that are absolutely critical to cities that I think have moved them up in that, in that hierarchy of priorities. 
First of all, cities compete with each other for a young, well-educated, mobile workforce and citizenry, and quality of life is absolutely critical, and cities see parks as an important delivery system for quality of life, along with great culture, dynamic retail, et cetera. Secondly, health, and I mentioned that earlier. There's an obesity epidemic. It's getting worse, and cities are dealing with that, and, and they understand that parks are part of the solution. And then third is climate. Uh, 750 cities have combined sewer and stormwater systems. Every time you get a major storm event, you get pollution going into rivers and harbors, et cetera, fines from the EPA. And parks, sponge parks, become a solution as well. They become the green infrastructure that can help solve that problem, as well as coastal parks and coastal land protection that can actually act as storm buffers. So you have three different ways in which parks now are becoming a much more important area for investment. And then the last thing that, that we see on a regular basis that, that excites me is that despite more than ever intractable politics, and it's, it's, it's hard to imagine a political situation right now that could be, uh, could be any more dispiriting than what we're seeing in Washington and frankly around the country, um, people really care about parks and they care about their landscapes. And we can say that because of the work that we do, polling and working with communities, with counties, with states, with the federal government as well, uh, on voter-approved funding initiatives. And over the last 15 years, I think we've done, worked on 450 separate initiatives with our C4, the conservation campaign. And uh, what we can say is that the voters and their elected officials are completely out of sync. Uh, when you ask people, no matter if it's in a red county or a blue county, white collar, blue collar, young, old, uh, will they tax themselves to protect what they care about? The answer is yes, absolutely. So the real question there is not so much um, do people care, but how do we give voice to that, that massive commitment to our landscapes and to the places we care about in a way that actually gets our elected officials behaving differently? So those are a couple of things that we're seeing that give me some hope. Again, a huge thanks for what we've heard today. Um, a huge thanks to the Olmsteads. Absolutely amazing. And I'll sit down and let the next person try their best to summarize what went on. Good afternoon. Uh, it is a bit daunting to follow Carolyn and Will and the rest of today's speakers. Um, so please bear with me as I do my best. Uh, my name is Mary Schoonover, and I work with the Resources Legacy Fund, a nonprofit that represents foundations and individual philanthropists as they wrestle with complicated natural resource issues and try to create enduring conservation outcomes. Uh, I also work with a law firm called Resources Law Group. Uh, we do more traditional environmental and um, uh, consulting and legal work. Uh, but it also enables us to work on campaigns, uh, particularly as Will mentioned, those campaigns that provide public funding for conservation and parks in particular. So both of those platforms provide us an opportunity to both study the Olmsted legacy and also try to wrestle with the challenges that are currently facing uh, the nation and the state today. So I want to talk to you today um, about a couple of things. One, sorry, I need to start with some numbers. I just I feel better that way, and because they are so um, compelling that there really isn't much doubt uh, once you walk through some of these numbers, where we need to go if, if what we're really talking about, as the Olmsteads were, is looking into the future and planning not for what exists today, but for the nation and the state of the future. And then I'll talk to you about two programs that we're working on that are trying to wrestle with both um, with, with these realities, not just the demographic realities, but the realities in general of the challenges. Um, so the first three slides I want to show you um, are from um, USC professor Manuel Pastor, uh, and they very, very clearly um, show the changes from 1980 to 2040 in terms of ethnic makeup within the state of California. What you should know is that the U.S. Um, charts look, look very much the same. Uh, California is a bit ahead, and Los Angeles is even further ahead if you were to look at the Los Angeles numbers. 
Uh, what's clear is uh, the diversity in California is increasing. Um, and particularly the Latino population is increasing and it's going to continue to increase uh, while the traditional white, which is most of the park advocates that we are and, and love, um, are diminishing both in the state and, and, and elsewhere. Um, to, to bring this kind of, to show you kind of a, a, a fairly graphic depiction of this, this is an animation showing 1980 to 2060, um, and it's a, a percent um, a people of color, uh, the darker the brown, the greater the diversity, and you'll see we're at 2040 now, 2050, and eventually 2060. California looks very different today than it did in 1980, and those differences are going to continue into the future. So this is one of those graphic uh, representations that I kind of can't help but show because it colors everything that we do. So not only is California and the, the US and the West getting more diverse, but also the, the, um, it's getting younger. <laughs> and looking at uh, the youth, uh, particularly youth of color, on the left you have US and on the right California numbers, and these, this is change um, uh, by race, race, ethnicity in the youth population. You can again see that what we're talking about is what's going to become a very influential group of Californians. Tony Jackson mentioned it earlier and others have as well, millennials. And we define millennials as born between 1980 and 1994. There's some debate about whether those, that's really the appropriate uh, time frame. But starting with those numbers, what you see is that this is a, a, an amazingly powerful group of individuals who have their own um, uh, ways of relating to one another and the news my preferred means of, get, of getting the news, NPR and newspapers, score very low with this crowd. This is a, a very different kind of a, a connected, highly connected, um, highly technologically savvy uh, group of people who are going to be deciding the next six presidential elections. So if you take away nothing other than that fact, that's pretty sobering. Um, but it also shows the power of this group. So a more diverse and a younger population. Um, we're also looking at um, the continuation of what we've seen in the past, which is a highly urbanized population. So uh, by 2050, 76% um, of Californians will be clustered in three urban areas, three urban regions within the state. So again, a continuation of the patterns we've seen, but to a point where, um, it, it, again, you, you can't ignore that if what you're looking at is how do you meet the needs of these people in the future? How do you make park, parks relevant to them? How do you reflect the services that these folks need? And how do you do it in a way that garners the public support necessary to continue the funding, to ensure people choose these as professions, to really engage what is um, a very different population today than when the Olmsteads did their plans and when uh, the park system was created and some of the major milestones along the way. So we have I have two projects I want to talk to you about briefly. Uh, the first is a very much on the ground effort. And what we looked at was there are a number of significant um, urban rivers within California that run through uh, primarily through and by communities of color. And in many instances, these uh, rivers actually were um, kind of wastelands or certainly not developed, not seen as um, assets for the local community. Um, and so what we look at, at the urban rivers that they should be providing for the local communities, recreation, an opportunity to explore scientific and um, natural education, um, actually connect with nature, the experiential work that we've heard about and how important that is to youth, and also, again, the healthier kids and families, that they ought to provide a safe place to recreate. Um, in addition, we're looking at these projects uh, as, a, as a means of building a more diverse community and conservation leadership, which uh, I think we all agree and we've heard about today is definitely uh, necessary, um, that, that these communities, when they are civically engaged, can in fact leverage public funding in a very significant way 
and we can create opportunities that otherwise do, don't exist within these communities. So the four primary rivers where we're working are the San Joaquin, the Tuolumne, the Los Angeles, and the Otay. Um, and each of these rivers, as I say, is in an area that's not only ethnically diverse, but many of them are underrepresented with park communities, uh, socioeconomically challenged, and also in great transition. Uh, so we started in 2006. We raised a um, little over, since that time, about $6.2 million in philanthropic funding and have invested in sometimes local individuals where community groups didn't exist, but in other locations like Modesto, so the Tuolumne River, the Hispanic Youth Leadership Council, which has uh, arrangements with 19 schools to actually provide leadership training and to get um, kids out and into the, the area. We've um, helped leverage more than $50 million in public funding to go back into these river parkways to develop everything from picnic facilities to uh, soccer fields to simply better pathways or sidewalks to get from the neighborhood to the community or to the urban river. Uh, more than 10,000 children have actually spent uh, better parts of days out in these um, in these urban rivers, and we're beginning to see um, the seeds of this labor by identifying kids who now talk about conservation as their primary uh, interest in, in a profession, and are actually looking at the, what we hope will be the conservation leaders of tomorrow. So it's mostly the benefits of this Urban Rivers program are mostly anecdotal at this point. We've got lots of stories and lots of pictures and lots of good connections with individuals, but it's on such a small scale that it's difficult to, you know, to really ramp up or to draw significant conclusions. Uh, but everything we've seen, this is some of the most creative work that we've been doing. It's also been some of the most difficult work to get funded philanthropically. Uh, it's, it's not really environmental education, but kind of on the edges, but that's also difficult to fund. It's not really traditional conservation work because you're trying to serve the community and sometimes it's civic engagement. So it's been a, a bit of a challenge, but again, it's one we're not gonna give up on because this is the future. And so far, um, all of the anecdotal evidence that we've seen has been just strikingly dramatic. Um, experience after experience, as the Sonoma County Parks folks were talking about as well, um, with a, a host of individuals and, and more and more are coming back or their younger siblings are engaging and again you get to see the longer term impacts. So from the community specific, um, you know, working with individual schools and children and, and uh, youth groups to a larger scale effort that you've heard mentioned several times today, the Parks Forward um, Commission which um, is attempting to wrestle with some of the challenges facing state parks. Uh, Tony Jackson talked a little bit about uh, the complexity of the state park system, and so I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, he also talked about the variety of services that the uh, state parks are intended to provide or, or do provide, and the diversity of the tasks that they have to provide, as well as their workforce. Uh, so what happened um, is uh, in basically beginning in 2012, but then in 2013, six California foundations, uh, primarily in the Bay Area, but also in Southern California, uh, committed nearly $4 million uh, to an effort working with the uh, Natural Resources Secretary of California to create a, a, a commission, a multi-year effort to try to address, uh, to chart a new course for uh, state parks to meet the needs of this changing population that we've talked about, to uh, focus on how you realign the Department of Parks and Recreation staff and uh, tools and systems, and also to create a, a stable, dedicated funding source. Uh, in June of 2013, and, and when Tony came on board in October, actually November um, of 2012, he also was very supportive of this effort. Um, we were dealing with a, a leaderless organization and had the new leader who came in not been interested, the effort would have gone nowhere. But Tony was enthusiastic. And so in June of 2013, Resources Legacy Fund on behalf of these foundations I mentioned, and they included some of the, the great foundations you've heard mentioned today, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, uh, Hewlett, Irvine, Marisla, Moore, 
Packard foundations, all of them uh, committed to uh, put, put their money where their mouth was and invested in a public process that had no guarantee of actually resulting in change. But they were absolutely adamant that that was what they wanted to see, not just a nice report, but, but fundamental change. Um, they selected a 12-member commission. Carolyn Finney is one of the, the members of that commission. Uh, the commission has a, a wealth of folks, uh, some who had a long and, and distinguished career in the national park system. Uh, we have folks who work with Sutter Health, medical doctors, uh, professors, um, uh, business chairs, former legislators. It's a very diverse group of people who care about parks. Not all park professionals, but they all bring their unique expertise. They are all very uh, actively engaged and um, strong-willed, so we'll see where this whole thing goes. Uh, but right now, we're working on draft recommendations. Uh, there's a meeting at the end of April that, where they will be talking about that draft. And then final recommendations in the fall. Um, they are going to stay around until spring of 2015, even though these are all very busy people, in order to try to see how implementation is going in what we presume will be the second term, uh, or the fourth, if, depending on how you count them, of this governor. Um, the, when we designed it, you didn't know if there would be a new governor, or, but this governor has decided to run again and basically has few challengers or few credible challengers at this point. So we think it'll likely be the second term of this governor, actually again his fourth. Uh, but, but you don't want it to get lost in the election campaign, so we want to make sure that it's actually implemented. So Parks Forward at this point is really looking to chart a course for the next century. Uh, to address all the significant challenges that we've talked about, but to provide very practical and specific recommendations that can be implemented. Some likely will require uh, legislative change, and we've already begun those conversations with the uh, legislative leaders. And the fact that implementation will continue beyond the tenure of this commission is um, a, a little troubling, um, but the, the basic reality of um, getting very talented people to commit for you know, some unending period of time on the commission is not likely. So we're working on how we can keep individual commissioners engaged beyond the official point. Because when they call a meeting, um, the, me the media shows up and the governor is there as well. Uh, I'll just mention two projects that the Parks Forward Commission is trying to launch in order to move um, the, build some momentum and move forward on some of the priorities that they've identified. Um, the idea is to begin to implement these projects in advance of uh, the, the final report being issued. The first is um, cabins. One of the impediments that we found in polling to uh, non-traditional park users actually using parks is an absence of any kind of alternative lodgings in many of the state parks. So it's daunting to have to go out and buy camping gear if you've never camped before. But if you can go to some place that has simple um, cabins, not even heated or electrical, but just a simple structure where all you have to do is roll out your sleeping bag on top of a cot. That's actually very appealing and you can do it uh, relatively inexpensively. We're working with Cal Poly Pomona to sponsor a graduate design course to design uh, expensive, efficient to produce um, cabins. And then we're hoping to um, launch them this year, uh, fund them privately. Uh, or through philanthropic funding, and then locate them in already developed campgrounds uh, where local superintendents are actually asking for them. So there are campgrounds going on, campsites going unused that they think if you could translate into a simple uh, place to stay, it would actually accommodate, again, some of these folks who aren't frequent users. And the final project I'll mention, thank you, is Google Trekker. Uh, we've been talking to Google for some time. It's like Google Street View, but for trails or for rivers. And what we're trying to do is to launch the effort to uh, basically have every trail in California parks, as well as every campground, um, uh, photographed using the Google um, backpacks and cameras. And eventually spread out from there, we'll have to start uh, small, uh, a few regions at a time. But we're actually looking to start in regions like the Santa Monica Mountains, where there's heavy use, but it's also not just state facilities. There are federal park lands, there are regional parks, and again, that intersection of uh, providing um, coverage, access, additional information to 
um, users, potential users, existing users, and being able to enable people to see before they actually go out on a trail what the conditions look like or what a campsite looks like, we think is actually going to make a significant difference. So we're hoping to pilot in about six different um, regions uh, within the next year and to get that effort launched by this summer. We may need to um, have some uh, budget trailer language added to the state um, budget bill that's actually going to be moving through the legislature shortly in order to cut through some of the procedures that oftentimes can slow projects like this down, just the review and control agency procedures, and to also simplify some of the issues that we think um, on a statewide basis will, be, will take care of themselves, but when you're just starting out, you need to simplify. So both the cabins and Google Trekker seem like two uh, areas of, of great demand, great need, and great opportunity that the commission is going to be pursuing. Um, they have a website, it's parksforward.com, and if you want to see more about their work and about Carolyn and her colleagues, please look at the Parks Forward effort. Thank you. The question that I want to ask all three of you is something that you all touched on to one degree or another as technology. Um, and just ask for your thoughts about how you think about that vis-a-vis -vis park space in a, in a state like California. And I should say all these questions, I think I want to borrow Mary's uh, frame and say that we, we assume in all of this conversation, as you put it, a younger, more diverse, more urban population um, in this state and want to think about what that means for parks and open space. So the first question to all three of you, how do you think about technology when, on the one hand, it can uh, help with access, on the other hand, there's this question of distance or even alienation from the natural landscape uh, when people are looking always at their screens? I can go for it. Do I have to? Mm -hmm. oh, no, I don't. You can hear it. <laughs> okay. Um, I've never tweeted, so I have to get that out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> so actually, I think. So I was, one of the speakers got up here earlier and, and, and she made the comment. And I said, Oh, I do that too when I can't figure out something with technology. I ask one of the students to do it. <laughs> And I'm thinking about um, when I got asked to be on the National Parks Commission before the National Parks Advisory Board, and it was an amazing opportunity for me. I mean, there was just some amazing established people on there. One of the things we talked about over the course of the year every single time was about young people. There was no one on the commission under the age of, uh, let me be safe here, 45. And I said, you know, it would be really interesting in, in, as it relates to technology, why don't we just invite them to participate? Because they may be younger, but they were actually born at a different time with a different set of knowledge and experience and a way of engaging um, technology as well as any other things. And for me, we, we sort of, we, I find that we often separate ourselves from who they are. Um, and actually, you know, I have some issues with technology. I also have some issues. There's a commercial that's running out now on TV about um, some phone or something, and they show kids in a tent. The sunset is beautiful, but the focus is on what's on the phone. And I'm just going, oh my god, what, that's like really messed up, and I do have a problem with that. At the same time, what I recognize is that uh, younger people have a comfort with technology. They understand it. They're thinking differently than I'm thinking about it. They're thinking more expansively. Uh, I don't know that we've really allowed them to show up in the room and talk about technology on their own terms. And so then we consider how to engage that. So, uh, it's um, I guess my 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 attitude is it's there, <laughs> it's you know, there. and the tendency has been oh it's in the way. It's keeping people from connecting. It's keeping huh. people from having a real. It's there. So then, so I think then the question is, how do you use how do you use the incredibly powerful network of communication that's there to actually um, get people communicating about great experiences in nature? So that's there's an opportunity there. And then secondly, how do you use how do you use those um, the technology as an interpretive tool? Um, because it's right in your hands. I mean, you can you know you get a bird song, you can find out what that bird is, and, and you don't have to know. And so, the, so the, the, the facility and the ease with which you can learn about your nat, nat, natural environment through that technology, I think, is incredibly powerful. So those are just two ways in which I think we can leverage it into engagement rather than disengagement. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things that we've seen in the Parks Forward effort, again, in the polling work that we've done, is that 
um, millennials don't really care what someone says about him or herself or uh, advertisers, uh, companies say about themselves. They're much more influenced by what their peers say. And that often happens in a, a, you know, through, through, an, uh, through a cell phone or through a website. So um, in order to appeal to these folks, we really do need to uh, develop the technological tools to enable somebody who's in a park to tell their friends that they're in a park. And they love being in a park and send a picture of what they're seeing and really engage that way. Um, as we've also talked about, it, you can also provide better tools for planning. It's really difficult to figure out if, if what you want to do is mountain bike, where you go, it's separate websites for each kind of facility, uh, whether it's own, each kind of, depending on who governs it, is it a state park, a national park, whatever. So figuring out a way to bridge that gap in a very, either by amenity or by activity is something that we're working on. And finally, for those people who aren't going to get out to see a redwood, or who aren't going to get to the Sierra and parks, to be able to enable them to have a remote access so that they can check in and see what's going on. I mean, I've never been at the Washington Zoo and seen the, the giant panda, but I had panda cam up for quite a while and was trying to see the baby. I mean, it's, it's that, that's, our, that's the, the world we exist in, and it can be a, an amazing tool if we actually uh, empower and enable that. Um, and again, not just at a state park level or a national park level, but figuring out how to do it across all park uh, institutions is the challenge we're currently wrestling with. It's a question that really comes up in architecture quite a bit too, that we have a generation now that experiences buildings uh, before, they see, before they move through them physically, they experience them on a screen and they see them from that point of view, and it's true of the landscapes uh, of, the, uh, of the state as well. Uh, the next question, assuming that we want, we're looking at a younger, more diverse, again, more urban population, and we're looking at built out cities where people might not have access to parks within a 10 minute walk, as, as Will mentioned. Where do we find these spaces in, in regions that are already built out, uh, in the park poor communities? Where do we find those spaces to carve out new, uh, new park space? Um, I, I can take a stab at that because we do a bunch of it. Um, we, you know, recycling, uh, you know, former industrial sites, um, land use is changing all the time. So those opportunities, brownfields are one. Um, in, in you look outside of Seattle, route, you, know, you know, Interstate Five was decked over next to the city. There's a wonderful park going across there. Um, Dallas just did the same thing with the Woodall Rogers Expressway. Um, uh, rail corridors. Uh, look at the High Line in New York, look at the 606 in Chicago, look at the Atlanta Belt Line. Um, in New York, um, Mayor Bloomberg adopted the 10-minute walk standard and, and, and basically said, yeah, but where's the land that I can d do this with? And he had the ability, uh, because of his control over the education system, to force joint use uh, between parks and the education system. And so by working on something like 250 playgrounds, with the kids greening those playgrounds, those are all now open after hours on the weekends in the summer. So they effectively become wonderful green playgrounds and neighborhood parks. So there are a lot of different strategies that people are using, even in cities unlike Detroit or New Orleans where there's a whole ton of land and the land is actually the problem. Other cities are finding ways to do it. And I just wanna kind of roll on top of that because I, I also think not only are cities finding ways to do it, actually people are finding ways to do it. And oftentimes in our conversations about cities, um, what I really wrestle with is this kind of separation. Somehow there's no nature in the city. When we set it up right from the beginning that there's a separation and people who live in the cities, you know, I always like to say, are you breathing? <laughs> You're right. in nature. Um, let's, let's start with that. You know, so. The idea, um, I don't know if any of you read a few months ago on the New York Times, I think his name is Ron Finley, an African-American man from LA who um, has done TED Talks now and everything. He grows food on the medians. I mean, he, you know, people have gotten creative and they, because they've had to do it and they've actually been doing it for a very long time. They're not necessarily recognized as parks, but there's a way that with, within which people have made their space and where they live creative, they found that nature, it is there. So I think that's why I mm -hmm. want to roll on top yeah. of that. But yeah. uh, I right think now. Will and Carolyn have taken care of the urban sector. I, I would just note that park poor communities are not only urban. Um, in California, one of, the, one of the regions that is the most park starved is the, the San Joaquin Valley. Mm -hmm. So it's where Fresno is, surrounded by 
agricultural fields. Um, so it's not that it's, it's developed in a traditional urban building developed, but there are very few areas of, of public access, very few outdoor parks. It's a very um, limited area for uh, swimming pools and a place that gets, you know, has uh, traditionally had 100 plus degree weather throughout the summer. Most kids don't know how to swim and don't have access to a safe place to swim. So again, looking at how you meet the need in differing kind of underserved communities, I think, results in a different kind of solution, uh, depending on what assets you have available. And following on that, this is my last question before we open it up to all of you, so be thinking of good and, um, and brief questions for our panel. Um, uh, once you identify those places, particularly if you're able to be creative about recycling spaces or um, I think in a city like LA, as I mentioned, the, the streets that were made for cars have all kinds of extra space once you start thinking about how those boulevards have been widened and as we begin to think about redesigning them, how much space we can actually recapture uh, for people who are not in cars. But once we've identified that space, how do we, what are the, what are the political challenges as you see them? Uh, Will, you mention Bloomberg. Does it take that kind of a political figure, uh, what do you see as the key changes that will have to happen in terms of our political approach to making, turning these spaces then into, into public spaces, into parks once we identify them? We spend a lot of time looking at cities or responding to cities that want our help. And it absolutely has to be grassroots. I mean, the, the, the community has to really care, but you also need elected leadership that cares as well, because you've got, you've got to have, the city has to be willing to put resources into this. Um, and there are communities that find ways. I mean, they, you know, they convert vacant lots into community gardens on their own with no help from anyone else. So there is great stuff going on, uh, but, but if you want a robust commitment to a park system that really serves everyone, you've got to have both very, very strong grassroots support and also uh, support, from, and, and you need a healthy economy and a whole bunch of other things on the checklist, but those are, those are two critical ones on the political side. Carolyn or Mary? Thoughts on that? I mean, what for you are the key changes that would have to happen in terms of uh, political structure in, in contemporary cities that would make it um, more feasible to turn more of this extra space into, into parks? Again, one of the things that we've been looking at through the Parks Forward effort is to try to break down some of the institutional barriers um, so that it's not a state parks, um, local park, regional park, but figure out how to, through partnerships and collaborations, you can actually provide a seamless network of, of access to parks. And the uh, institutional barriers are you know, only as limiting as the creativity and the, the kind of tenacity that you have to deal with them. Some are bigger than others, but there are times when you've got public funding there are other times when you really do need to bring in either private business or philanthropic funding to, to be the seed money, to get it happening, to give somebody the image of what it could look like. The first time I heard about restoring the Los Angeles River, one of my colleagues told me about it in the late 80s, and I laughed at him. I mean, I, I just didn't believe, and then he, was, he proudly marched into my office a couple of years ago with a bird guide for the Los Angeles River. I, it was, so it, it is a certain amount of that, um, um, you know, suspending reality and looking at what could be possible and could be there, uh, assembling both those who have the, the political authority to make something happen, those who have the resources, and what the kind of partnerships could or should be, whether it's a joint powers authority, some of the most effective groups are friends groups, and uh, you know, local parks, figuring out how you engage the local community both to advocate for it, to raise funds for it, and also to help cover some of the costs of uh, interpretation or educational programs as well, and or trail building as the case may be. So um, it's, it's um, I don't know that there's a one size fits all, but there is a path. It's just a, a, a multi-year, sometimes multi-decadal mm -hmm. path. It's not necessarily um, a, a quick fix or a near-term mm -hmm. answer. I guess the, I was trying to think, um, I always get nervous when I hear politics, but uh, <laughs> I think, um, just for me, the politics of who actually has a power and whose vision actually counts. I hear a lot from nonprofit and community groups who have ideas, you know, the assumption they have no ideas and they have no time. And they're actually, they have a lot of ideas, but they're not the ones who have access to the money. So they can't, um, they can't realize their idea right on the ground. Um, 
yeah, we, that's a long conversation, but I think there, that's real. It's real. I hear it over and over again from nonprofits and grassroots people who can't get the money, but they've got the ideas, the energy, the know-how, and the desire. So, and, and I think that's long. That's got to, mm -hmm. you know, that's, yeah, that's been going on a long time, so I'll stop. And one thing that's happening in Los Angeles is there's beginning to be a conversation between both of those scales. So, so uh, uh, our mayor, Eric Garcetti, looking for ways to put some guidelines in place that, it, that actually allow communities, neighborhoods in a grassroots way to propose new park space in their community and streamline that process uh, and the approvals process for that. And I think that's something that we'll all be watching carefully in Los Angeles. And as important as those grassroots local efforts to create park space are, I think Greg Heiss is really right that we have to still think uh, about the larger, the macro scale. Even in cities like Los Angeles, there's an opportunity to be thinking at the metropolitan scale. That's why I think, uh, as, as several people have mentioned, the LA River is such an important um, potential vehicle for some of uh, the efforts that we've been talking about because it cuts through the entire uh, city and I think the streets the same way. It's one of the reasons I've been writing so much about the boulevards in LA because they're the one part of the built environment that operate both at an intensely local and at a regional metropolitan scale. And I think when you're talking about LA and its problems with open space, you always have to be uh, keeping the metropolitan scale uh, in mind, even as even as that means confronting the political obstacles with all of the jurisdictions that are involved in shaping uh, that environment. Um, so we have time for a few questions uh, from the floor. Looks like many hands are already going up. I would encourage you to ha uh, have a question, keep it very straightforward, um, and to the extent possible, if you want to raise questions about what we haven't talked about today, I would encourage you to do that. And so I think the microphone is probably making. Right here. Thank you. Hi, my name's Rachel Jacobson. I'm from here. I'm a millennial. Um, <laughs> so there, there seem to be a lot of programs addressing kids in school needing to get out and see parks, getting in touch with nature, all of that kind of stuff. But what is the role of millennials and the challenge, challenges to engaging millennials in the near future of parks? And as professionals and as the public and like, Technology seems to be kind of an obvious answer, but how and what else? What is the role of millennials? So just because I can't help myself, what would you want your role to be? Right. I was going to say the same. Why don't, why don't you answer that? I, because I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be funny. Uh -huh. I actually wouldn't, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to tell you what your role is. My background is in landscape architecture and I want to work as a landscape architect and whether it's parks or, I mean, I want to make, help make all the things we've been talking about in this room come true. I feel like I'm uniquely positioned to actually contribute, but what about everyone else? But let me, let me put the question back to you. For, for you and for your <laughs> generation, if, you see, if, if people you know are seeing a landscape first on a screen, does that mean that you feel more connected to it when you finally get there and that it may, may open up in new ways uh, for you? Or do you feel as though you've already seen it and it has a different and maybe less uh, impressive um, meaning for you once you get out into the space. Do you know what I mean? I do. I was asking myself that, and I kind of went back and forth as to what my answer was. So I don't have a, I don't have an answer. So it's both. Yeah. yeah. It probably depends on the person and their familiarity. I mean, I don't look at you know the pictures of redwoods and go, oh yeah, they're big trees. I go, I remember being there. I want to go there again. Mm -hmm. But that's because I've been there. Maybe someone else goes, eh, it's just a bunch of big trees. Right. Right, and I, and I think one thing we didn't talk about is the role that these memories that we create as children play, the same way that the architecture of schools is so important because it gives students a message about what the culture thinks of them, and I think kids read the architecture of schools for, in a very sophisticated way. I think the same is true for landscape, and that was something that you mentioned, a lot of people have mentioned, is the experience of those landscapes that we are out in when we're young and how that continues to inform our feelings. And I just want to connect it for you because I know you, I, I'm feeling like we didn't give you anything. Um, <laughs> we put it right back on you. That those stories, so I'm listening to you and thinking you have stories to tell. You know, how do you articulate those stories? Stories turn into vision and policy. You know, Olmsted had an experience. You know, we don't talk about stories because we often dismiss them as being anecdotal, but actually they inform perspective, they inform vision. They inform a way of thinking about an idea like landscape. They create language. This is what I feel millennials can do, and that the story of who you are collectively and what it is that you want and how you vision the future, that's how that comes out. You all have 
Im immense voting power. We saw that already in the last two national elections. And that's when you start voting on these ideas that you believe in. I mean, it sounds corny, but actually I think that's at the foundation. Yeah. Also, I, I think there's an opportunity for every generation to pass values along to the next generation. And so that opportunity will arise for a lot of millennials in, in the near future. And I think the experiences that they share with, with their children are going to make a big difference in terms of the future of support for nature and parks. Let's take a question in the back. So probably for uh, Mary and Will, um, but please, all of you. So uh, you're talking about the difficulty of uh, taking parking lots away, uh, freeways, uh, urban, uh, you know, polluted areas, but in you know Olmsted's view and others would have been like we should be thinking even bigger than that. Um, th these are like postage stamps that are really important because that's all that's there. The question is, we are now in the biggest oil boom in the history of this country. So we used to get money from the federal and into the state governments for doing urban parks all the way down to the cities, not just state, but down to all the local governments that they could do a ball field, they could convert a site, they could tear down a building. So I know both TPL and, and I know that, Mary, you've looked at a lot of uh, financial things. What's going on from the standpoint of why, why are these young people being cheated when we're, we're drilling more oil, making more money off oil in the United States than ever before? We used to have the Land and Water Conservation we Fund. Up, do we have time for one more question? Maybe. Very good. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, that is the question. What is going on with with any discussion about oil, oil money, oil tax, like land and water, to come in and help fund some of these things? So I, I would say there are two things that we need to do. The first is to engage the, the next generation of voters with parks to, again, help them see that, and their legislative leaders why, why they should care about parks, why if there's money to be spent from an oil severance fee, it should go to parks as opposed to higher education or something else altogether. So it's, it, that connection can't be overemphasized. But second, we are in fact looking at a variety of different options for a dedicated source of public funding, not just for state parks, but across the spectrum of parks. And we think that uh, 2016 may be the time to pursue that. Uh, and whether it's paired with uh, higher education or on its own, um, again, building the constituency and the leadership, but also looking at every conceivable effort that's going forward to figure out where we can most effectively hitch our wagon. And that may be getting um, fees for fracking, if fracking's going to occur. Uh, it may be slant drilling, if slant drilling's going to be permitted. How do you get money back into parks like the Land and Water Conservation Fund so that you have that uh, cycle complete? If marijuana is going to be legalized, I say good for us. We ought to get in there and get our piece of the pie. But it's really looking ahead to what are the most um, advantageous opportunities and how you can ensure then that the money goes to high priority, not postage stamp, but places that actually are relevant to the communities that live there. And that means engaging those folks in the discussions about how the money is to be spent, where it's to be allocated, not just tagging on a few soccer fields to try to appeal to certain kinds of voters, but from the ground up, building your priority list and criteria to reflect what is both now, but primarily the future needs of the, the citizens. That, you know, it's again, not an easy, straightforward task, but it's absolutely what we need to do. Just very briefly, the Land and Water Conservation Fund exists, as you know, taking you know, offshore oil royalties and putting it into conservation. It's been authorized at $900 million a year. It's almost never been fully funded. It wasn't indexed, and it's about to expire, and, and which is, you know, we're working like crazy because there's money for states, there's money for cities, um, and it just hasn't been happening, and part of that is the political situation that we're in right now, and that pendulum will swing, but it's taking a long time. So then you look at state, county, and municipal opportunities. We're working on a $500 million a year, 20-year constitutional amendment in Florida right now that would create $10 billion of funding for conservation and conservation stewardship for the state of Florida. So it's not just a federal game. There are opportunities in California. We'll have a water bond, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's a big... You know, it's a big challenge, but there are big opportunities, and it needs to happen at absolutely every level of government and private funding, too. Would you thank the panel?